Hey gang, Sean here, reminding you that if you like our videos, please hit subscribe. If you love our videos, please consider donating at patreon.com slash commandersbrew. Uh, what you're about to see is something a little bit different for us. We've got a guest, Johnny Crass, who maintains a commander cube. Uh, we've recorded an audio episode of that, but we had our cameras rolling, so we're going to present to you the YouTube version of that episode. Uh, it's a, just under an hour long, and we're just talking all about Commander Cube, how it works, how you decide what cards go into it, and how to play it. Enjoy! <laughs> Gang, welcome. Thanks for listening. We have with us Johnny Crass to talk with us about your Commander Cube, which Andy and I got the privilege of trying out in GP Las Vegas a year, uh, two, one ago, two ago. I already uh, forget. Time yeah, is meaningless. Thank you for La being Las here. Las Vegas, though. yeah. Oh, thanks for being here uh, yeah. to talk about the Cube. We're so excited about it. Uh, I guess the first thing we want to cover is just to, we're going to assume that you the listeners kind of know what a cube is in general for traditional drafting uh but johnny Cress, could you go over like how this one works differently i know that uh so how many people sit down to a table to draft your commander cube maybe the first question should be how many cards are in the commander cube so currently there are 720 cards in the cube and that's not counting the 44 commanders Okay. Ooh, okay. So there's two pools. There's commanders and there's cards. Gotcha. Great. So let's so let's say eight people sit down to draft. Yeah. Now so, how do you how do you set that up? Um there's an initial pack of five commanders each. Um and then six packs of fifteen. You're primarily trying to build an eighty card deck, uh, including the commander. So um, in our early testing, we found that 100 was kind of too much of an ask and 60 was too small. Mm -hmm. So 80 was the perfect medium. Nice. So you've got a 44 pack of commanders separately. How do you, yeah. and, and are there any special rules or tricks and tips about getting those packs to draft? So um, with a pot of eight, you're going to be leaving four commanders out. That's just purely random um two of the commanders out well there are two commanders for each uh color identity besides the four colors there's no four color commanders okay um and there's no mono color but there's two of each guild two of each shard two of each wedge and two five color okay okay and, and when the you last say two are wild cards um but that's well, let's go. Let's go into those. I think that's great insight. That's the kind of stuff I'm. I'm so curious about. So that's that's a clue of the makeup of the commanders. And so, no matter how many players sit down, you just shuffle up all but four of them, or do you scale it for the number of players? Um, we the cube also supports just a pot of four. Um, because anyone who's ever tried to cube before, it's a lot easier to find four than to find your eighth. Yes, true. Um. <laughs> And the ideal commander game in most most of our minds is four. So you can just shuffle half the cube and then do repeat the second one with the other four. So Oh, so you could have two separate pods just kinda doing their thing separately. Yeah, or just have the same pod go twice, um, if you're just there for the night. Oh, you don't have to reshuffle everything. You just uh put it aside and go again. Yeah, do the other half. Cool. But it's completely random what four commanders will get uh, pushed out. Okay. So is, is the decision to have that number, like, why wouldn't you just either take four commanders out and or add four commanders in? Like, why was that? Why, why did you guys decide to have, like, the four leave out random thing happen? Um, so we wanted to have two of each color identity that wasn't monocolor because monocolor is pretty much impossible to draft. Right. Um, and then a problem we ran into pretty early on was four color just felt like five color, mm. except normally it was better. Ah, okay. Um, so when you started rem to remove those, and you, it just made sense to have two different generals for each color. Right. That way, uh, if you wanted to draft, say, like, Gruel, you didn't have to like always find the one gruel commander you could maybe 
pick up the second one or and you um, and you can't play this this initial draft pick. I just know this just because we played it. But when you pick up, say, like a Grixis commander, and then you're like, "Ooh, cool, Nicol Bolas or whatever," uh, and then you can't play like a, a an is it one? You also pick up like the next pick, right? You can't play that inside your deck. No. So um, for my cube specifically, the commanders are actually in different colored sleeves than the rest of the cube. Mm -hmm. That way. Um, there's no confusion there right. because then we originally did it the other way, but it just meant people drafted three or five color generals and then just played the good two color generals in their, in right, their deck. Right. Sure. And free extra picks. Away from that. So, so we've all, so, so the, for the round has gone, let's say there's four of us and we've drafted some commanders. Are there multiple packs or there's just that one pack of commanders and when it's done, it's done. So there's only a, one pack of commanders but there's also i mentioned the two wild cards oh yeah what are those yeah. um, oh i remember so this. wild cards are for my cube it's urza's head ha. um and wild cards give you access to depending on where you drafted them so if it's a third pick you would see three first pick you'd see one out of a wild card section and pretty much what the wild card section is is commanders who we want to test but don't want to put in the main packs or we've deemed too strong or too weak so you're pretty much taking a chance and gra grabbing out of a set of commanders that may be really strong maybe garbage or maybe <laughs> just something we want to test that we haven't put into the mainstream yet okay Whoa. and so the later the later if i'm understanding you correctly the later in my commander pack i draft the wild card urza's head the better the more cards i get to pick from so the better chance i have of getting a really cool commander but if i pick it first i could get a garbage commander exactly <laughs> and i mean it goes from uh wart bogart auntie i believe she's the black uh red black goblin one um, yeah to like Najila and Madrotha. So it's pretty much all over the place as far as power level. Right, right. Fun, so, fun. So w why the decision though to make it that you only get one if you, so doesn't that mean that no one will ever first pick it just because you only get the one pick? Well, so, so that's the point is I want people to draft the commanders that are oh, okay. more supported and offered. Mm -hmm. But if you like to gamble and you like to take risks, the wild card is there that as is kind a, of a fallback. That is a very fun, like, that's a nice ad. I love that. That's a great idea. So that, that's that's a fun... Uh, Go ahead. Something I really got from Hearthstone, because I love all the random Hearthstone cards that would, like, give you a random card. Uh -huh. And sometimes they're amazing, and sometimes they're absolutely garbage. Yeah. But that's... Yeah. Great. That's so, cool. So, so I've... we've been, Let's say we've been through the draft now. We've got a handful of commanders... Uh, and I've got commanders of different color identities. I've got some threes and a couple of twos. Now we go to the regular draft portion. How, is that the same as a traditional cube draft? Uh, we're going to pass left, then right, then left, then right, then left, then right for the six packs? Exactly. Um, so you're not cemented into a commander right away. You're pretty much just drafting and see, see what shakes out in your packs and on the table. And you're just drafting normally. Um, there's two Cogwork librarians in the cube. Two but of they're them. the only like draft matters cards once you actually get into it. Okay. And remind okay. us what that card is again. Um, Cogwork librarian is a artifact creature from Conspiracy 1, I believe. Yeah. That um, you can take it out of a pack, you reveal it. And then you can put it back in a pack at any time to take two cards out. Right. Yes. Is that the only double in the whole cube? It is. Originally, it was Cogwork, Librarian, and Leovold's Operative. But Leovold's Operative um, works slightly different than Cogwork and would always me mess up the pack order because you take two and then skip the next pack. Oh. And we'd always forget and then feel like someone messed up the packs right, and yeah. there'd be a five minute <laughs> conversation about that. So, I mean, that's, that's good practical thinking on the fly, making it better for the experience. Yeah. 
cool. So so then so presumably how many packs in before I kind of know like oh this is probably my commander. What what do you find like is it better to draft a wide range of commanders or commanders that share so that you have more flexibility? I guess this is the eternal draft question. Yeah. Um so I think in my experience it's different for everyone who's drafted the cube. I personally try to test every commander that I add um, and it means I am often drafting outside my comfort zone because I'm very much a, like a Johnny. I love Storm. I don't really like creatures. <laughs> um, but last night I played Boros Equipment. So how did I like that, how did that try go? to test new commanders. But there are people who draft the cube and they draft a commander they love. And then there's people who draft a cube and draft the best deck they see. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's it's really cut to taste. I think we have a guy who will draft Enchantress every single time he picks up the cube, <laughs> um, and then we have another another guy who will always just take the best commander he sees in the pack and just try to try to go through the draft that way. Cool, cool, cool. I, I think we may have. Uh kind of gotten off track here did you say there were two wild card options we talked Um, about the urza's head version is there something else in the commander pack oh no they're just both both urza's heads it's more just that there's it it makes the numbers even to have two wild cards i see two copies of the wild card neat uh and that's a placeholder no one gets to use urza's head at the end yeah it was just um (laughs) originally they were full art altars of commanders i had had done but Urza's head is kind of the perfect, perfect wild card in my mind. It's yeah, yeah. five color, legendary, goofy card that it's is just kind of a perfect placeholder. Yeah. Great. Well, so and then and then we brew decks of eighty cards, including the commander. So that would be seventy nine in the main. Uh, yeah. Do you have any partner commanders in there? Um. So we have one partner commander right now. All the partners are. Um, they come with their partner. So the only partner right now is for Abzan, and that's Timna and um, I can't remember the big black green snake, Ikra Shadiki. Right. Yes. So if you draft um, one of those, you ought, like if if you see Timna in the pack, you automatically get Ikra Shadiki, right? Like if I remember yeah. correctly, they're not even in like one of them isn't even in the thing. Is that right? Um, now we've just started to put them in the same sleeve. Oh, okay. Um, cause it's just easier for people. But yeah, the, the partners are locked with each other. Right. Neat. That's cool. That's very Neat. cool. Neat. So this is amazing because, uh, when we looked at it last, the only partners I recall if were Bruce Tarl and, uh, uh, the li- uh, Aki yeah, line Akir- slinger, Akiri, Akiri, yeah, Akiri yeah. line slinger. So it was just a Boros partner kind of thing. But that has, are they? So they've they're at now out, and these two are in. It's so it sounds like this cube goes through a lot of evolution fairly quickly. So yeah, yeah maybe we is, can yeah. Oh, this is version a three point seven, I believe. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So so let's get into then like. Oh boy, there's so much to talk about. So how do you decide, like, I guess the bigger picture is what kind of games are you looking for? Like what kind of, what kind of games is the, because I know that the whole point of a cube is you get to kind of create the environments you want to play in. So what kind of commander environments does this cube set out to play? So before, I guess the first time I ever made the cube was right after the initial commander precons dropped right after Innistrad, I believe. Whoa. So years and years ago. Yeah. And then I got really into other formats and I kind of gave it up. I tried to make it again around Theros and stopped. And then recently, about a year and change ago, um, my group was very into competitive EDH. Um, We just kind of grinded on that format for a while. And what we actually found was we just burned ourselves out of that format. Um, everything was so tight. There wasn't a lot of room for brewing and there was always the best choice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one day we finished shuffling up a game of competitive EDH that like we all knew the outcome after turn two, it just took six turns to get there. 
Okay. And right. <laughs> we we kind of asked just what we were doing with the format because this isn't the format we fell in love with. This isn't Commander EDH, right? Right. Yeah. And pretty much what we decided to do was we all sold our competitive EDH decks. Um, and with the money for mine, besides paying for my rent for a bit, <laughs> I started to build this cube. And the idea was to be the casual EDH we remembered. Um, so cards like Liliana Vess, a card that would never see play in competitive EDH, is just something that was in a very early draft of the cube because I remember playing, <laughs> playing EDH like 10 years ago with that card and being like, this card's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, that's the one that like tutors up a card. Yeah, and goes to the top and she costs five and yeah. Yeah. Um, but pretty much it's trying to get back to the kind of EDH you'd play at a kitchen table or like maybe a pickup game at a store. But cool. nothing too... I believe there's maybe one or two infinite combos in the entire cube out of 720 cards and they're like three or four card combos yeah great it's fascinating so it's, it's trying to be that casual edh that most of us remember and enjoy so then i guess that that kind of segues nicely into our question i noticed like uh, so obviously people talk about cards that are potentially bannable in edh uh, so what are your thoughts on then like things like Sol Ring or Cyclonic Rift? And are there any like peculiar omissions that the, the, the community basically considers staples that you have not included in the cube? So actually, I try to avoid um, cards that would be considered staples. Uh, in very early drafts, I gave everyone a command tower um, because it just kind of made things easier. And what I found is Command Tower ne would only ever reward the five color or three color decks. Yeah, I was about to say, it was, that, that kind of has more value for those decks, yeah. And it makes the two color decks worse by doing that. Um, additionally, if you're drafting, you can't have, at least in my mind, cards like Soul Ring, uh, Mana Crypt sensei's divining top cards that are just unpassable right mm -hmm. so and they sometimes just lead to non-games so the solution is just to have no fast mana and then from there we started looking at other cards that are staples but kind of lead to non-games so cyclonic rift any time walk effect that doesn't exile itself um, I'm sure I'm think forgetting some others, but just the cards that w when you build an EDH deck outside of this cube, you're like, oh yeah, I have to include this card. Right, yeah. Most of those right. cards will not be on a list. Okay. So interesting. What about, so then uh, I've got your list here. Uh, thanks for sending it up. But you do have certain staples, things like Cultivate, I know, is in there. Uh, like Beast Within. Though, like, So you're not talking like sort of individual staples. You're talking the game taking over kind of staples? Yeah. Um, like there's no... Insurrection was in the very early drafts of the cube. And um, our cube kind of has a joking Hall of Fame. Cards that I've added over the course of its life that um our play group has pretty much banned out of the cube <laughs> oh yeah well, okay what are some of those um oh and yeah and these cards include insurrection nexus of fate razaketh um just cards that the way my mind works these cards are all perfectly fine magic cards but yeah. when you spend 40 40 odd minutes drafting um, and then it just kind of ends the game. It's not exactly the best feeling in the world. <laughs> Did Razaketh and Nexus of Fate get uh, banned together? <laughs> um, actually, no. Uh. Nexus lasted quite a bit longer than Razaketh, but um, that's because I was pretty stubborn about that card. <laughs> that does not exile itself. 
It does not. <laughs> and then we replaced it with Beacon of Tomorrows, and then that got banned pretty quickly after that. Uh, wow. Yeah, those extra turn cards are dangerous. Can yeah, you... the only one we have right now is Karn's Temporal Sundering, I believe. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's a good one. Nice conditional one, right? Yeah. Uh, what about... Uh, so I'm, I'm just looking at... So while we're on the topic of specific cards, um, I notice... Like that, you don't have like exsanguinate or torment of hailfire or like large like black X spells that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> For sure, I about X spells. I love X spells. I just love it. Like because I'm like, what about exsanguinate? What about dead to the deathless? What about torment of hailfire? Why are those not in here? Um, so our main X spell is Jaya's Immolating Inferno, and the reason for not having the other X spells is. I wanted to keep um, that identity kind of away from black because that identity for black in my mind is the Cabal Coffers, Urbor, the big black deck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's not really an archetype that's within my cube. But um, blue-red spells is an archetype. So by not having the big black x spells but having the red ones uh you kind of nudge people towards if you want to do the big spell stack these are the colors you kind of want to be looking at mm. so there's no like uh big mana like jund deck or something like that or you know we're like you um, stack things and get a bunch of mana that way or something like that like is ashnod's altar in the in the cube um, no, there's no, um, no Phyrexian altar, no Ashnod's altar, okay. because one of the commanders for Jund is Prosh. Right. Oh, really? So, <laughs> Prosh is in there. Prosh is pretty fair once you remove most of his toys. I was going to say, yeah, if you're not, you don't have food chain or whatever, all those things are there. Cool. Cool. So, and then, so I know Andy and I, we're, we, we would love to, I mean, you know, no, there's no, there's full transparency. We fully intend to do a cube as well. And one of the reasons we are so grateful to have you on the show here is because it was, it was hard to get as motivated to just like look at someone's list and put it together. Uh, yeah. Part of, part of the excitement of a cube is actually putting it together yourself. So, I mean, ultimately we're hoping to take some of the, you know, your philosophies and ideas and kind of apply our own uh, logic to them and one we were just thinking about the other day like what about a card like the immortal sun which is like arguably like that that is on a borderline of like a must pick card if you see it pack one pick one uh how do you like what was what's your group's thinking on that so immortal sun is actually pretty early on a card we added and um it's because there are enough planeswalkers in this cube where super friends is a pretty supported archetype either in bant or in five color and when you play against a super friends deck in edh or pretty much anywhere else you always kind of feel like you don't have enough answers mm -hmm. and cards like the immortal sun while they're just generically good and probably always as you said a must take if you're seeing it pack one pick one also just help shore up decks who can't deal with two or three walkers on in play at a time okay so there there are certain hate cards that are in this cube like uh curse of exhaustion eidolon of rhetoric uh Cur immortal sun uh we just added limvala keeper of silence about two Ooh. nights ago is that Ooh. the is that the original linvala it is Ooh. and so but i so guess the there's no mono colored deck it's a little bit tempered in the power level um she's tempered and most of the commanders don't actually have activated ability oh she's i'm sorry i was thinking of, a, of the wrong one yeah she's the activated ability one yeah um, and the the other ones you mentioned were the ones that make it so you can only cast one spell per turn. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's to shore up the fair decks pretty much against the decks that are doing far more degenerate things. Cool. So that's a, that's a nice tip if you're ever drafting this cube. Take those hate cards if you feel like your your strategy isn't one of the degenerate ones. That's 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 a and the degenerate yeah, ones a, probably wouldn't want those cards. I'm a big storm player. 
and I need I try to acknowledge that I sometimes make the archetype too strong in my cube, so we have ah. a, a balancing factor there. <laughs> okay, let's use that as a... So then how, how do you decide? So you've mentioned Storm. I think, Johnny Kress, we probably share a lot of brewing ideas. I do love a good Storm deck myself. How do you, as a group, keep the cube fair? How do you make sure that like everyone's in agreement on what goes in and out and that sort of thing? How, like, so, like, I guess, could you talk us through the process of how you as a group decide what goes in and what comes out? So for the current version of the cube, um, I initially had some groundwork ideas and some notes, but our play group who drafts the cube regularly is about 12 people, including myself. Whoa. And while I keep um, the archetypes pretty much uh, flowing through the cube, um, pretty much everyone in the play group can submit cards, veto cards. And that way it doesn't just become an echo chamber of me thinking, oh, this card's probably fine. Right. Um, but I also want to support archetypes that um, we don't all play. So most of my group would not touch Boros with a 10 foot pole, Right. but we have an entire Boros equipment deck that pretty much lives within the cube um, if a stranger ever drafts with us or right. someone who likes to be down wants to be down. So we keep those archetypes supported, but not fully focused, if that makes sense. Ah, interesting. So, interesting. And that's, a, that, that, I mean, like, that's obviously a bit of your, your guys' own play style influencing the cube. Like, if you're saying it's not super focused, but it's there, it's... um. I, I just think it's neat that you guys keep it in there. I think that's a like a, a nice bit of uh, I don't know what you call it like, say impartial almost, <laughs> to uh, yeah. to archetypes. That's great. We probably have, I think, our possible archetype wise, I'd say like, sixteen, fifteen, and that's kind of including tr the four or five tribal decks that also exist. Oh goodness, would you be able to? Would you be able to kind of just rattle off as many as you can remember? Uh, and then I guess the most, sort of my follow-up question or simultaneous question is, how many of these are tied synergistically to their commanders? Like, do you have archetype first, then you picked the commander from the commander pack, or did you kind of build the other way? Um, so we have Big Ramp, which I think covers about half the green decks. <laughs> so it's either Lands Matters... Um, like the Cultivate decks, uh, Elf Ball. Those are all like big ramp decks in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Artifacts Matters, um, Commanders, which also kind of dovetail into blue-red spells. Um, they care a lot about the mana rocks and all that, that kind of thing. Uh, we have Reanimator, re Enchantress, um, Equipment, Control. We have a little bit of Stacks, but that's kind of the idle on things um and there's like little subcategories for all of those of course there's aggro decks sure, yeah. that and are... would you say would you oh, say ahead. that some of those like so those you, you mentioned that those archetypes are shared over multiple commanders because i know there's no mono green commanders so like many are you suggesting that many of the commanders with green are sort of the big rampy style or can you just pick a commander and just do whatever you want within those colors? Um, kind of both. So like a uh, commander, that's a pretty good example is wind grace. Uh, sure. He's in my mind, a big ramp kind of graveyard style grind him out deck. But at the same time we have, decks like Zakama, where she's also a big mana play lands deck, but you're not really trying to grind him out so much as blow him out, right? Your general's free, <laughs> and then you just kind of crunch in with this giant dinosaur. Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess now that reminds me of, so how do a lot of your games end? Like, do they end with like, 
like is there any mill decks in there is it always just a bunch a big board of creatures kind of trampling over i haven't looked is crater hoof in here um crater hoof is not uh mainly for the reasons i said about cyclonic rift and stuff sure but um we recently got uh end rays runners i think is the card the new crater hoof yes. from um yeah yeah from conspiracy or not conspiracy or yeah, ravnica yeah ravnica right Legions, yeah um, and that card's been pretty interesting, but we do have a a mill deck in the cube um, with psychic corrosion and Sphinx's tutelage. Um, kind of, you draw a bunch of cards and you just slowly mill them out. Um, we also have a laboratory maniac deck, okay. which has been. Um, I kind of added it in as a joke because. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with like no ad nauseum or doomsday or any of the. What about like Enter the Infinite? Stuff Is that, that in makes there? him good. Enter the Infinite. Uh, you got Enter the Infinite. You got that one in there. Uh, no, <laughs> nothing, nothing quite like that. Okay, okay. But the Lab Maniac deck has actually, I think, won three of the four games it's been drafted in so far. Which really? Has been pretty cute. Who who leads those decks, if I may ask? Like, who's who are you gonna want at, as your commander for a lab maniac deck? Um, so I believe two of the games were with Locust God, and oh. it's just kind of an incidental yeah, lab maniac win. And then one of the games was Riku, and that deck was very devoted to winning with Laboratory Maniac. Ha oh. <laughs> ha drafting with a game plan and playing towards it. I love it. I um, love it. I've got a question about uh so so first of all just wanted to start uh this question by saying how long do games last usually do you think? Um so the draft itself is anywhere between 25 and 40 minutes depending on who our pod is and how well they know the cards. Right, yeah. Um and then games they tend to be a bit shorter than an average commander game I found. Mm. So our average, we can like run through a cube draft included in, I think just under two hours. Okay. Um, but that's also because we know each other's politics. Now we know each other's draft styles. So there's a little bit of, um, group group knowledge there. And you guys but have been playing together for, for a really part, long time, right? Shorter than normal EDH game. You guys have been playing together for, for a really long time. You guys know each other's stuff. And, and you've been playing with these cards in this cube for a pretty long time, too. Am I right? Uh, it's been... The cube has been going for about a year and a half now. Oh, and we've okay. been playing together probably six years. Oh, okay. So, okay. I thought the cube was around longer. Um, uh, because I, I remember when we played, uh, it was a pretty long game. And I thought it was due to there being so much life gain. And I and I thought I was like, I thought I had just included a little bit of like incidental life gain in my deck. But I remember it ended up being a big thing. And then someone else had like, is there, are there a couple things like that where you're like, hmm, there might be like, like we find that sometimes this makes games go longer. Uh, like we talked about, you talked about not having something like Crater Hoof in, which would obviously make a game much shorter if you could get to it. Um, is there anything that you find does make games go a little longer than you might like? So our actual fix to that, because we noticed that after Vegas, is that the life gain decks were kind of running away with certain games, um, is more to temper the strategy rather than to make the game itself go faster. Right. So we started adding cards like uh, Rampaging for Ostodon, Erebos, cards that would kind of control the life gain deck a little bit and make uh, the Punisher deck, which is actually kind of new for the cube, a bit more viable Ooh, what's that and then if we notice an archetype kind of running away again um, we look at it look at changes that we could make to kind of slow it down a bit that way everyone's kind of on a level a level field so we just included so, some hate cards yeah so, so you it, just it sounds like you cards into the mix right that's a great that's a great summation so instead of just like um, nerfing decks that are doing pretty well, just add a few hate cards to it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. This, so this plays well then so that you can still draft the decks. And I presumably as always, like if you're only drafting half of a cube, 
you don't always see all the best cards for it. Like if I know the cube inside and out, I can pick which of my favorite 79 cards there are. But those 79 cards may not be in the pool and I may not have access to them based on what people pick. So how much redundancy is in the cube for... I guess I can ask this question two ways. I was it's sort of on the redundancy angle, but if I know the kind of deck I want, what like, sorry, my question's not clear. Well, I guess what's how what's the balance between building highly synergistic decks versus just picking the best card in your colors on curve and just having a general good stuff deck? Yeah. So, from what I think the question is, you're asking um, how open are certain archetypes, or should you just like play good stuff dot decks right yeah like like am i gonna always do better with just good stuff or will i be rewarded by going really synergistically because it feels um, like i like i remember when we drafted I, I i had like three decks like two of them had black two of them had green or sorry commanders two of them had black two of them had green so i was like okay i'll just start drafting black and or green that way i'm gonna be pretty safe and, and it did feel like at first i was just picking good cards and then as the draft went on i started like I was like, oh, okay, I'm leaning more towards this Abzan thing. So, like, it, yeah, yeah, how does that work? <coughs> I think for the most part, your um, your first two packs are really you either getting your fixing um, for your commander or what you want to be playing or just picking up solid cards and letting that guide you into an archetype. But once you start down a pathway to an archetype, for the most part, um, it's pretty open and you can, you can always play play the deck if, uh, if you want. As I said, we have a guy who forces Enchantress every every time he drafts with us, and it's <laughs> not because Enchantress is overrepresented. It's because if you want to get in, into that deck, you can get into that deck. Hmm. So, Fascinating. So yeah, so it is. It is. It does kind of end up being like that, right? Where it's, you kind of stay open, and then once yeah. you start down a and, road. Uh, we actually, uh, one of our five colors pretty early on was the Ur Dragon, the big ten ten for nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and we actually ended up cutting him because he he became too much. Draft the best card in every pack, and you have a ten ten as your finisher. Right. And mm. that's just not. I don't think that's fun for the person drafting Ur Dragon. And I don't think it's fun for the rest of the table where sometimes your the synergy card you wanted to wield just got taken out of the pack because it was the best card there. So that leads me to have a question, which I always think about in, in cubes in general. And I guess it's a little easier when we're talking about a regular cube, but a commander cube, uh, I, I would think this would be a, a, a specific brewing the cube sort of uh, issue. What is the mana like in this cube? Like how easy is it for us to go five colors? Cause you would think maybe that like you're saying what happened with the Ur dragon is like, why don't I just take the best card out of every pack and just take fixing and go five colors? You know, if, if I drafted a five color commander, like why would I bother? Why would I even bother really like picking an archetype at that point? I could just do five color good stuff. Like how, how did you guys sort of deal with that possible issue? So currently in the cube, there are three, three sets of what you'd call dual lands. We have the uh, pain lands, the, uh, the temple cycle, and the Ravnica bounce lands. So that's uh, thir 30, 30 out of 720 uh, multicolor lands. Um, additionally, if you look at the actual list of commanders, you'll kind of notice that the two color commanders are on their face stronger than the commanders who may have more colors mm. uh -huh. and especially stronger than the five color commanders which okay. are sign of the ur dragon and general tazri um, okay so the way we actually fixed it is we rewarded being less colors by being able to take uh greedier mana costed cards like uh triple black cards and by just making the mana not as great. Right. And then additionally, because um, I've drafted the five color deck a lot and I love just picking up as many, many dual lands as I can and just hoping my deck <laughs> has perfect mana and works. <laughs> um, we started putting in cards like Damping Sphere and Blood Moon oh, to really? make 
the less color intensive decks even stronger wow interesting i would never have guessed blood moon would appear in uh like a this kind of commander cube but i guess it it just makes a lot of sense uh well if you have that many basics because you guys aren't including a ton so so fixing in general it seems like is kind of tough to come by uh do you give like what does the artifact ramp look like i know you said there's no fast mana but do we get fixing in from artifacts does is fixing only really like like i know in sean's cube uh he'll he stuck the fixing just to green right like that's a thing he wanted green to have like is there anything specifically like that you guys have done so originally we were playing the signets and then the lockets got spoiled and the lockets were pretty much the best thing to ever happen to the cube in my opinion oh really really um so currently we're playing the lockets, uh, the diamonds, um, the diamonds. Okay, yeah. And then we have coalition relic, uh, dragon's horde, and dark steel. Is it ingot? I yeah, think it's ingot. Yeah, dark steel. Yep. Um, and those are the like three five color rocks. And then there's a bunch of colorless, like the mindstone hadron archive cycle. Right. Okay. Uh, Sisse's ring a few other like little colorless ramp pieces but for the most part there's one of each monocolor ramp one of each guild and then three five color ramp rocks um cool so there's a little bit of fixing there but not a crazy amount so you got to prioritize that if you if you are go- trying to go five colors, not only do you have these generals that like I'm guessing because you you, you mentioned Dragon's Horde and Scion that there's a Dragon Tribal deck in here, a five color one. Uh, there is a Dragon and an Ally Tribal deck. So both five color generals have a tribe if you want to go into them. That's that is also very interesting. Like you've limited the scope of those five color decks so much that. You should. You're not only going to have trouble finding the fixing, but you you're going to want to go tribal with them for them to be powerful enough to to swing with the big boys. Does anyone just draft five color good stuff though? Like, is that ever a thing that happens? Um, actually, I draft five color good stuff a lot. Oh, really? And it's mainly uh, it's mainly with Tazri, and it's because yeah. Tazri has uh, can find Harabaz Druid, which, which is, is the ah. ally that taps for allies. <laughs> yep. Um, and that's a pretty. A, it's one of the uh, setup for an infinite combo in the cube. <laughs> and B, it's pretty easy fixing for that deck. And it's normally to play five color walkers because uh, that deck's a blast. Uh, right. Sure. No doubt. No doubt it is. Uh, so I guess, and then just looking through, how much of your deck is like answers? Like, how do you balance like global answers like wrath of god type effects versus specific answers exile target creature or enchantment etc so um in a more recent draft we ended up actually cutting him but uh there was an argument for gaddick teague to be one of the commanders okay and it was to stop decks from always just drafting sweepers rather than drafting spot removal and there's quite a bit of spot removal in the cube Mm-hmm. And the idea was, if Gaddick Teague's uh, a potential commander, you would take Hero's Downfall or like Path to Exile over, say, the Damnation. Um, and that way, you kind of are a bit more fluid. And while we ended up cutting him, it actually, I think, helped the draft. Because now, um, cards like Swords to Plowshares and Hero's Downfall are actually pretty high drafts. As well as damnation, but you you'll notice that the sweepers are pretty much exactly in ratio with the one for one removal. Whoa! Um, as far as as far as picks go, or as far as number of cards in the cube, as, as far as numbers go. Okay. But one for one removal is also outside of black white, where black white is pretty much where all the sweepers live. Oh. Ah, so we're not going to see your uh, uh, Utter End or Anguished Unmaking? Uh, anguished Unmaking is in there, as is Merciless Eviction. But, okay. But um, Black, Black White is pretty much 
that that's their identity right is being the removal suite of sure of colors so there's no i guess azuri's predation could be argued to be a green sweeper but there's no yeah. like green green wrath in the cube there's no hurricane or whatever right i noticed there's no earthquake either in my quest for x spells yeah um early on there was earthquake but what actually ended up happening is people wouldn't draft it because normally it would just get them killed. <laughs> so there was kind of a a breaking point for cards like Earthquake. Right. Interesting. Okay. Amazing. Uh, I, another thing I want to ask you about is I know that uh, – so we have a personal cube that uh, we play in our meta, and I know that – one thing that's very fun is just putting it just chock full of those conspiracy cards that let you double up secret spells or cast things without paying the right color mana. I noticed there's not a huge number of conspiracy cards. So what was the decision there? And like how much room for like goofy decks and like weird stuff do you have in there? So conspiracies were an interesting problem that we came across pretty early on. And it's, they really break down into two parts. There's the ones that find cards or find copies of cards. And then there are the ones that are pretty much just broken. <laughs> yeah. And we don't want to play the just broken ones, but the other ones ran into a different problem, which is your color identity. Yeah. So having a conspiracy that lets you pull a creature out of your sideboard or out of your non-deck. Um, we also then have to have a weird writer about it breaking color identity or not breaking color identity. Ah. Hmm. Um, so it just made it easier to completely ignore having conspiracies in general so that sure. we could respect what makes Commander Commander. <laughs> but yes, uh, uh, then sure, I, I agree with you. I think... Obviously, that makes a lot of sense. Those are regular problems. But I do have to say that might be an interesting way to... Because we've all fantasized about, like, if only this commander had access to this single card outside of its color identity. And maybe those are ways we can get those fantasy games of commander actually happening. I imagine since you can't do fully tuned decks, like, just from a list and just put it together... You have to come up with some like interesting uses of cards you've never seen before, interesting combinations. Uh, I know when I played, I was starting to brew up a Ural the Mist Stalker deck with enchantments and things, but I ended up having a pretty strong token sub theme of it because I just couldn't make every card perfect for Ural. Yeah. Uh, how many cards in like would you say are more geared to a very specific commander? Like, are there any cards that are there for basically one commander? Or are most cards, like, you know, between a range of, like, four commanders to every commander? So, I think, for the most part, there is a at least two or three cards that, when you look at it, you're like, this is for this commander. Um, but at the same time, those cards also carry over pretty well to other commanders. A good example of this is Inspiring Statuary which is yes. the um, artifact non-artifact spells have improvised card. It is it was placed in the cube for Sahili, which is one of the generals, the new Sahili planeswalker. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um because she is very much this artifact storm deck, very focused on making spells cheaper, playing a bunch of artifacts. But what most people found in testing statuary is that it's also an amazing card in the equipment deck. Ah, um, yes. Because you can tap of your course. sword or your GTA for mana, more or less. Of course. So cards that on their face are really stuck with one commander actually have quite a few options. Now, there are cards like Gitrog Monster in the cube, and Gitrog's pretty much solely for Windgrace. Like, other decks can use him, but Windgrace really uses that card. Right. I see. I see. Uh, that's that's great. What, so you kind of touched on the fact, how do you decide when a commander, or I'll rephrase, how do you decide when a legendary creature is better suited to be in your suite of commanders? 
and when does it live in the the cubable the draftable cards like when you decide a commander is no longer going to be in your commander suite does it get downgraded to being in the main draftable area or does it go to that wild card zone so it depends if a commander ended up being too weak often it'll go into the cube or just get cut altogether um we just ran into this problem with the little aurelia uh, mm-hmm. ah. she was put in because we thought she'd be fast and aggressive but she ended up just kind of being slow and uninspiring mm. okay so we just kind of moved her away but if someone becomes too powerful which we just ran into with um Eureka, i believe is the ninja yeah yes um, those go into the wild card packs. That way, if you still want to play that commander, there's a chance you can, but they're not in the general population of commanders. Do you keep a limit on the wild card like pool? Like, is there is it like there's always going to be like X number of cards in this wild card pool? So like when Yuriko um, goes no, in, you I take actually any out or... change up the wild card pool pretty often, and it's the one thing I won't consult the rest of the players on uh-huh. and i don't let them look at the pool <laughs> so i'll change the pool quite often just to keep it fresh and interesting but for the most part other people drafting the cube won't even know what's in the pool but like is there is, is it is it a certain number or do you just pull things out when you feel like it and so on um it sits around 20 for most of its oh, most okay. of the time but sometimes oh, it's a lot sometimes it's more 20 is like a lot Neat. that's pretty big that's cool so yeah, how I, do you... I like to keep it to where you won't always hit a fire card, but when you do, it feels pretty great. Cool. Now, how do you, like, so how often do you play the cube? I guess, let's also, when, when new sets come out and new cards come out, I mean, I imagine you could draft a cube four times and never even see the card because it has to be drafted by a person who wants it and then they have to make it in their deck and then it has to show up in the game. So how do you end up actually figuring out like when new cards are working or not working? Like if Yuriko has a bad go, you won't think she's powerful. So how do you eventually decide that, yes, we have enough statistical data? So I actually have a notebook where I jot down um, commanders' win and loss records, Mm, primarily just their win records, um, and just kind of keep an eye on that number. If the number becomes a little bit too egregious, uh, we talk about it. But for the most part, we draft the cube, I would say, maybe two days a week or one, one day a week, but we'll probably get in three or four runs with the cube during that draft session. That's, uh, okay. that's pretty good. Yeah, the um, the store where we play at, uh, he pretty much will just give one of us the key and tell us to clean up and lock up after ourselves, and we'll be there oh, until about 2 in the morning. What a dream uh, scenario. That's great. That's really oh, good. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, well, we're, we're nearing the episode's end. We're almost at time. Uh, my goodness, this just flies by. Um, uh you, I, I've got to say, it's been wonderful talking to you about this. You're extremely, like, like very, like you're, the way you answer the questions is extremely direct and eloquent. And I think I have an amazing sense of how this goes on. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Uh, I feel inspired to keep going. Um, I hope if you, if people want to reach out and ask you some cube questions, would you be welcome to them doing that? How can they reach you? Um, so I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter. It's where I'm the most active and that's just Johnny underscore crass. Um, I also have a mostly up to date list on cube tutor and I've been trying, trying to promote this format actually quite a bit recently because I think we, we always hear this discussion of playing commander games with like pickups and then you have to have the five minute discussion about power level yeah i was about to say yep and what i found is i've been trying to play this a little bit more with um strangers people outside the play group and that's kind of in a weird place for me because uh i'm about more than halfway through and foil in the cube 
So oh. it's getting to a point where it's a little bit expensive to play with strangers. Yep. But at the Wait, same sorry. time, well, the I, reaction I, I've I... gotten from people is that everyone's deck, for the most part, fe- feels like a real deck, and they all feel balanced. And I think that's a great place for Commander in general to be, right? Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. that's th- that's the games of Commander we remember and enjoy. Is Truly. Where everyone's doing their thing but the game still ends in a reasonable time. Did you what did you say right there about strangers? I just didn't catch it. I just cut out for a second. Uh sorry, what was that? You said something about uh, your because the cards are expensive, there's something Oh, yeah. I'm I'm a little bit I'm kind of a foil nut. Okay. So, when I started building this cube, I told myself I wouldn't foil it because I lied to myself. <laughs> uh, and when I started foiling it, I told my fiance about it. And she was like, yeah, every, everyone but knew, you knew that this was going to start getting foiled. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now we're at a point where we're starting to pick up judge foils and expeditions and stuff for the cube. Oh, wow. So it's sometimes hard to sit down with a table full of strangers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what? That's a, that's a very good... Uh... That's a concern even we were thinking about uh, when we were th- th- talking about putting putting ours together is like how, you know, how do you play with strangers at a GP or at a store when you've got cards that are worth hundreds of dollars in, in this cube? It's just it's obviously like you want to think the best of everyone, but we've all yeah, heard there's... heard horror stories of, you know, um, I actually learned from a fellow when I first started coming to the shop and he had a powered cube. And he would have you count into the draft and then count out. And I think that's probably the easiest way. Is everyone has six packs and a pack of commanders. And you just, at the end, count out six packs in your pack of commanders. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, at that point, if someone, yeah, like, yeah, that's the best way to protect yourself. And I think you've also given us some wonderful, like, guideposts of how you approach brewing that one could certainly apply those and make a more budgetified version, right? Yeah, as, and as lo- the games will this be... this cube was designed to be it on a budget, and then... <laughs> yeah, where'd you get your time twister from? Um, <laughs> the time twister is actually one of the few things I kept from when I sold Tassiker, uh, okay. my competitive EDH deck, mm. because it's just such a fun magic card and at the end of the day i knew one day i'd want to shuffle it again (laughs) so nice yeah (laughs) yeah we looked at the deck list and we're like oh okay this is uh it's like it's like four four thousand dollars or something for this whole deck it's like oh that's almost all in time twister (laughs) like yeah take time twister it cuts it in half or more there's also a bazaar of baghdad in there right which i think is Uh, fairly we actually ended up cutting bazaar oh (laughs) because it just was too um the early question sean asked about when is a card too um too Too, honed to one commander too narrow yeah that was pretty much what bizarre became is carador and maybe scarab god wanted it and when we ended up cutting carador no deck wanted it carador got cut that's what i played and i won in in vegas did Uh, carador in the end didn't have enough support really found that he just didn't really do much so we replaced him with anafenza how and dare you actually been doing pretty well oh man i remember getting i remember playing carador and being very pleased with everything i had <laughs> yeah we call we call vegas the graveyard days because it was really when the graveyard decks were putting up pretty absurd numbers oh really okay, okay. yeah good to know well great uh, this has been excellent. So you've told us where to reach you on Twitter. You mentioned it was on Cube Tutor. How do we find it on Cube Tutor? I'm not familiar with that website too well. Oh, so Cube Tutor's website is pretty hellish overall. It is. Yes. Um, uh. So the actual way to find the cube is to Google Johnny Crass Cube Tutor. Okay. And right. Then it'll pop up. <laughs> but you can... for some reason, Cube Tutor doesn't let you search users actually on Cube Tutor. Oh wow! Yeah. What a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, we'll also, also obviously include Cube the Tutor's link. 
uh, putting in, card in it, interface, you have to do it one at a time by set. So oof. if you're using it, good luck. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But okay, like once great. you have it up, it's actually pretty good, right? Like that's why everyone still uses it. Like I know, like we use it for our um, our our uh, peasant deck and it, our peasant cube rather, and it's like it lets you it lets you like mock draft it and stuff like that. So it's actually like one side of the website's good and the other side of the website is pretty pretty brutal. But yeah, we'll include yeah. A, a a definitely a link to that uh, in the show notes here as well, and we'll we'll probably tweet it out. So yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Great. Well, thanks for talking to us, Johnny Crass. Uh, I can't wait till we run into you again and have another crack at this Commander Cube. And who knows, the next time we see you, we might have ours ready by then. But, yeah, you know, been... we're, we're, we're a little slow on the uptake on that, but uh, we'll hopefully soon. It's been almost 100 and change episodes, but I finally got on the show. Yes, it's <laughs> yep. good, yeah. Yeah, well, thanks uh, so much for being here, Thank you very man. much. Yeah. Big thanks to all our patrons who make these episodes possible. Yeah, and if you want to check out more comedy videos, check out our Bruise News playlist. Make sure you follow us on Twitch TV to see when we play live. If you want to chat with us, head over to Twitter. We're at Commander's Brew. And please hit subscribe to Ding the Bell and find out when we got new stuff coming out. See you next time. Bye.